Xenoblade Chronicles. Xenoblade Chronicles 1. Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition, whatever you call it. This game has had a profound impact on gamers and RPG fans all over the world. I remember vividly when my 11 year old self first laid eyes on that key art when looking into an IGN article about Operation Rainfall. And as confused as I was, I was also very intrigued. But I soon heard nothing but praise for this mysterious game from critics, veteran fans, newcomers, and even many doubters. And on top of that, even some of my close friends and family would tell me how much this game meant to them and the profound impact it had on their lives. And with the launch of Definitive Edition on the Switch, I of course was finally able to experience this masterpiece for myself. Xenoblade 1 has met with numerous 10 out of 10 scores, masterpiece titles, must play recommendations, and just overall critical and commercial success from fans and critics alike. But I've noticed something recently. I noticed that over the years, especially with the franchise growing post Xenoblade Chronicles 2 and the release of the Definitive Edition, the game has received more criticism than usual. Many people are asking now, is Xenoblade 1 really a masterpiece? Is it overrated? And does it even compare to the other games in its own series? This is all very interesting to me since from as long as I can remember, Xenoblade Chronicles 1 has been heralded as a fantastic game and genuinely great JRPG. But why am I even rambling on about this? What do I have to say? Well, first of all, hey guys, Nishquick here. I think many of you guys know what this game and what this series means to me. I've recently completed my New Game Plus run of Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition and I want to make this video in defense of Xenoblade Chronicles 1. I've been seeing a little bit of negativity on this game, but I've also seen some solid critiques from others as well. Like I said earlier, I remember this game being a near universally loved game, so this somewhat sudden switch up on this game is a little interesting to me. This video is by no means a jab or direct response to anyone else who did not enjoy this game. In fact, there's a lot of pretty good reviews on YouTube which adequately and fairly break down the parts of this game that just didn't work for some people and weren't very good. But today I wanted to spend some time celebrating how great, timeless, important, and really profound this game can really be. It's one of my favorites of all time, and is sometimes often misunderstood. I'll mostly be focusing on story, narrative, characters, and themes here, but I'll also speak on some gameplay and music related things too. I hope some of you guys can relate to this, or maybe I might even change some of you guys' minds. Also, after completing the script, I want to preface that to defend this game, I often had to refer to things from the other Xenoblade Chronicles entries in the series, so here is a major spoiler warning for all numbered Xenoblade Chronicles games, that's 1, 2, and 3. And before we finally delve into this video, if you enjoy Xenoblade Chronicles, JRPGs, and Nintendo games, hit the like button, it helps me out tremendously, and if you enjoy any of the things I mentioned before, subscribe so you don't miss future videos from yours truly, Nishquick Pops. Anyways, let's get right into defending Xenoblade Chronicles 1. Don't you just love when a cast of characters feels like family? Sure, you can say that for the lovable characters in Xenoblade Chronicles 2 or the down-to-earth and relatable Ouroboros team in Xenoblade Chronicles 3, but there's something truly special about Xenoblade Chronicles 1's party. They feel like childhood friends you've grown up with all your life, actually. To those of you who have known friends since your childhood, don't show Grind, Fiora, and Dunban just give you that vibe? Through their natural interactions and quirks, and the very relatable depiction of their close-knit relationship, you just get a very homey and nostalgic feeling from these guys. Of course, with the early scenes you see with them, but also in their heart-to-hearts, you don't really need to know everything about their life and story prior to all of this to be sold on their relationship. Fiora's affection towards Shulk, Ryan's brotherly bond, and Dunban, acting as a mentor and role model, are clearly portrayed and heavily emphasized. And they don't feel stereotypical or tropey. 
but so genuine and relatable. Like I said, they feel like a best friend, lover, or role model you've known all your life. Colony 9 just has that vibe. It's a simple but nostalgic town that makes you think of home. In my opinion, it's no Fawcett Village to me since that's one of my favorite towns and locations in all of gaming, but as I play through Xenoblade 1, I start to form bonds with these people, and even if I don't go out of my way to do every single one of their numerous and annoyingly tedious side quests, I stop by every now and then to see the Gem Man, Kenny Rohan, Nira Nira, Vanguard and the Military Academy, and other people in other places just to ground myself and remember, this is still home, and it really feels like it. These feelings are etched into from the very start of the game, and that's what makes Metal Face's attack and the Mechon raid on Colony 9 hit so much harder. You spend so much time falling in love with this place and all these characters, and the quest to get revenge fuels your drive even more. Outside of Colony 9 and the main cast of characters, the supporting characters are also very strong, like Melia's brother Callion, someone I initially didn't really like, but I grew to really appreciate him by the end of the game. Or someone like Vinaya, who actually plays a very integral part in the story. Or even much smaller characters like Dunga, Vanguard, Juju, and Atharon, who add some levity and even some important moments to the plot, narrative, and character development for some characters. My point is, a lot of these characters don't need the tragic backstories, extensive lore, or dark secrets to back them up to make them even more important and impactful to the story. These party dynamics, interactions, relationships, and motivations are enough for them to stand on their own in this epic story. I just love how natural they all feel when they're together. So many moments show how they fit so perfectly together and play off each other so well. Like when Sharla will scold Orion for saying stupid things and misremembering basic Homs history. How Dunban loses his cool and has to be brought back to reality by Shulk's encouraging and heartfelt words. How Fiora confides in a friend like Melia to express her concerns regarding her legacy and loved ones. It makes them feel like they're truly a family and a team of people who love each other and would fight to the ends of the world for each other. Xenoblade Chronicles 1 is often overlooked for its simpler characters versus characters like Pyra, Mithra, Nia, Noah, Mio, Rex, all these characters having extensive backstories to flesh them out and possibly even direct connections to other pieces of Xeno lore like the Trinity Processor or Origin Administrators. But that doesn't take away from how impactful, down to earth, relatable, nostalgic, and emotionally impactful this cast of characters makes you feel. They're still a strong family, and maybe not as directly familial as the Xenoblade 2 cast, they do feel like family with a very strong bond. Not gonna lie, I was kinda hoping Future Redeemed would give us a Xenoblade 1 version of that family picture with all the cast in the future, but alas, at least we got to hear some really nice affinity scenes from Shulk remembering his loved ones. So I've talked a lot about the characters, but I do want to touch on some gameplay related things before I delve deep into the story and themes. Overall, gameplay and combat is simple and honestly very approachable compared to the other games in the series. You're often pulling off the same combos and getting into really repetitive battle situations, but for a JRPG that came out in 2010, it really works and it really feels great. I personally love visions, and the fact that an important story element plays a massive impact in the combat and gameplay is a very ingenious idea. Gem crafting and allocation is a little more tedious than it needs to be, but it's similar enough to a materia system that it gets the job done, at least some cool customization. I also love how each character plays differently and their playstyle is very indicative of who they are as a character. This series really iterates on combat and gameplay and I truly feel like each following game is a genuine step in the right direction, but that doesn't take away from what this game does well. Also, might I remind you, this game came out on the Wii, like the Mario Galaxy in the Wii Sports console. <laughs> These areas, open worlds, and just the sheer level of scale and scope on top of the combat and gameplay systems at play here are absolutely astounding and incredible. 
a true display of Monolith Soft's genius and game development wizardry. I want to discuss the music here too. Though this OST isn't my personal favorite in the Xenoblade series, it's most probably the most iconic OST next to Xenoblade 2. I will never forget making sure to approach Gower Plain in the daytime and Satoru Marsh in the nighttime just to hear their respective themes upon entering those locations for the first time. The area themes in this game are unforgettable and just remain stuck in your head forever. Whether it's the serene melodies of Magna Forest, the homey tunes of Frontier Village, or the bombastic symphony of Sword Valley. Speaking of Sword Valley, I want to talk about the musical motifs for a bit right now. Did you know that Sword Valley's theme is remixed for the Great Swords bass in Xenoblade 3? And not only that, but the flute melody in the end of Sword Valley is exclusive to the remastered OST in Xenoblade Definitive Edition on the Switch and was not in the 3DS version or the Wii version. And this flute melody was predominantly played in the Great Swords bass in Xenoblade 3. It's kind of a stretch to connect these two melodies in that way, but it's interesting how this part of the song was added specifically for Definitive Edition. And even if it wasn't added at this time particularly because of Xenoblade 3, this specific version was remastered for Great Swords Base, and that continuity is really nice to hear. Speaking of motifs, this game doesn't have as many musical motifs as Xenoblade 2 and 3 do, but one that sticks out to me is the song Memories. It's a melancholy song used in the sad parts of the story during cutscenes where characters might reminisce on better days and loved ones who they might have lost. But the song's main motif also plays in the Alchemoth area theme, which I always found interesting. It's like the rich history of Bionis and Alchemoth is also full of sad memories of the High Enti and the Giants, and the unfortunate reality of the source of the Telethia. Especially with how things turn out for the High Entia, it's interesting to see how this song sort of foreshadows their untimely and unfortunate downfall. Even as you explore Alchemoth on your first visit, it reminds you how Melia will eventually have sad and broken memories to hold on to in the future as a heavy burden. A friend of mine once made an analogy to Xenoblade 1 and 2 stories upon completing Xenoblade 2, which I really appreciated and resonated with. He said, while 2 is the emotional roller coaster and often the more heartfelt of the Klaus games, 1 is a grand, massive, epic adventure, just full of cinematic moments, grand and expansive locations, high octane moments, jaw dropping plot twists, all that stuff and so much more. Despite this, the game is simple yet profoundly effective in its storytelling. Simple does not necessarily make it bad, and I'll be referring to that a lot in this section of the video. Xenoblade 1 isn't only just shock value and big cinematic moments. The story has a genuine level of nuance and depth that makes it stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with not only the other Xenoblade games, but in my opinion, the other games in this grander Xeno meta series. And of course, in comparison to other JRPGs of the similar caliber. In fact, Xenoblade 1 inadvertently hints at concepts and story beats that appear in games like Xenoblade 3, and not directly because, as we know, Takahashi had no real idea that a sequel to this would ever come, but the fact that these story beats even exist at all makes me feel like this is a tried and true Xeno game and has always fit perfectly like a glove in Takahashi's grand narrative next to all of his other masterpieces. I'd always see Xenoblade 1 as a game about rewriting destiny and reshaping an uncertain future. But that's also just because of the iconic lines from Shulk about changing the future, the marketing taglines, and of course a lot of the memes. There's so much more to it than just that. Xenoblade 1 explores themes of reminiscing in the past and holding old grudges, stagnating aimlessly to maintain a status quo, and of course, taking a stand 
and willing to confidently walk a path that you carve for yourself. It is simply presented, but it's also so complex, nuanced, and just a powerful story full of depth. And I want to explore these three themes I mentioned since they're the ones that I resonated with the most personally when playing this game. Let's start with holding on to grudges of the past. This is what Egil's character centers entirely on. I love how we can often compare Egil to Shulk because of his obsession with annihilating the opposing titan, but he's also a true foil to our beloved protagonist. While Shulk is always anxious about the future and how he's often burdened by the duty to save people from his visions, Egil is stuck in the past and full of vengeance and resent towards Zanza for what he has done to his Machina brethren and his once best friend Arglas. Shulk and Egil's confrontation and final resolution is a very beautiful moment. Two opposing sides finally understanding each other, but it truly was not easy coming to this conclusion from both of them. Egil sees Shulk not only as a blind vessel, but also as the deity that stole everything from him. Shulk sees Egil not only as the leader of Bionis' lifelong enemy, but as the ruler who took the life of his loved one and many others in his hometown. But in that one perfect moment, they come back to reality and see what has come to pass in this singular present moment. Egil leaves his anger for the past. Shulk forgets his anxious feelings for what's to come. They reach out to each other, Homs and Machina, to build a brighter future together, hand in hand. And this is what Egil has always wanted. If you look back at his conversation with his buddy Arglis, it reminds me of the ambitions, hopes, and ideals of the Ouroboros team in Xenoblade 3. The will to walk to a brighter future hand in hand alongside those who may look, act, and live differently from you. Within the simplicities of Xenoblade 1, the story inadvertently sowed the seeds of a theme that would come back many years later to cap off the Klaus Saga. I got a little bit off topic there, but I just love that dichotomy of Egil living in the past, growing ever vengeful and angry, and Shulk eager and anxious about what's to come in the future that he has a major hand in shaping, but ultimately understanding each other, accepting each other's sorrows, and learning how they can shape today to build a better tomorrow. I hope you get what I mean when I say this, but <laughs> it's the most Xenoblade moment ever, and I love it. <laughs> it's simple, but it really works. Simplistic motives and feelings from both characters, but it's just so genuine and it hits so hard. Zanza is often criticized as a one-note, one-dimensional, boring, and simple villain, and I frankly never understood this. I initially did feel like, hey, this god just kind of came out of nowhere. But then I went back and rewatched the cutscenes. I was blown away by all the foreshadowing. It was right under our noses this entire time. Shulk's anger and at times animosity, his visions and premonitions, and of course his connection to the fabled Monado, slowly but surely pulling him in the right direction, only to snatch his life and his sanity away right in front of him. Zanza being a god of the Bionis makes him a lofty and grandiose villain in itself, but the nuance of his motives and character comes from the titular man of the saga himself, Klaus. Klaus's ambition, greed, and lust for power manifests as Bionis' almighty deity Zanza, but as a god, Zanza grows lonely and longs for connection and friendship. Not only does that provide some slight sympathy for our tyrannical god, but I question and often think, did Klaus feel this way too? Was he lonely, and was his desire to birth a new universe caused by something like this? That I'm not too sure since we only really see how Klaus feels after the experiment and his regrets, but as a god of Bionis, Zanza stagnates and maintains the constant flow of life and death to preserve his power and perpetuate this endless existence. 
all he wants is power and the life of Bionis to fuel him with life and energy. Does this sound like someone we already know? Someone whose name also sounds with a Z? Is actually named Zed? Well, yeah, Zed and Zanza are different in their own ways, but a lot of Zanza's motives reminds me of how Mobius perpetuates an endless now to feed off of the lives of others. Zanza is portrayed in a more simplistic way, but again, simple does not mean bad. Zanza is cunning and wise in how he preys upon those who can fulfill his goals. A strong giant with ambitions of traveling to other worlds as a vessel to wage war against the Mekonis, and a young boy with his whole life ahead of him, only to be used as a vessel for a god's perpetual stagnation. Bionis is full of so much life and culture, and the people want to choose, build, and cultivate a future for themselves. And this is something that leads to the next thing I want to talk about. Shulk's will to change the future, the party's ambition to shape a brighter tomorrow, and the true purpose and power of the Monado and what the blade truly symbolizes. As I played the game for the first time, I was confused on what the Monado truly was and what muddled things even more during my first playthrough was how Alvis kept telling Shulk to seek his true Monado. But after completing the game and relishing in this story for years and now replaying it, it makes so much more sense. Not only because of Shulk, but because of Fiora too. Just hear me out on this. What I've understood Monados to be in the Xenoblade series is that they're divine tools to shape one's future and the destiny of others, directly connected to the Trinity processor powering their respective worlds. But to unlock their full potential, one must be pure of heart and truly have the will to make a significant difference. A strong heart, mind, and will to forge a path ahead to a life full of possibilities and growth. We see this from all Monado wielders in the series. Of course, we see it with Rex once he truly learns to understand, love, and accept Pyra and Mithra. He unlocks the Aegis's true power which is also Monado by the way if you didn't know. Noah does too, once he understands everything N has been through, and how he and his fellow friends can break the shackles of Mobius, he brandishes the Sword of Origin and unlocks the true power of his Lucky Seven. If you want to learn more about this, shameless plug, but check out the Conduit Cast episode we did about this. And of course, Shulk is no different. The Monado 2 was unlocked by Zanza himself to manipulate Shulk further on his path of destruction, but the Monado 3 was called forth by Shulk himself once he understands that he has the potential, the strength, and the will to shape a future without the need for tyranny and control from an overbearing deity like Zanza. It's a simple moment, but it speaks so true to the rest of the series. This moment, it's <laughs> it's also the most Xenoblade thing ever and in its purest form, the protagonist finding his true will to shape a bright future ahead and unlocking the full potential of his divine sword to carve a path ahead. Again, it's so simple, it's so Xenoblade, it's so typical JRPG. <laughs> but wow, in the context of this game, it's so impactful. Don't worry, I did not forget about Fiora either. Vinaya did see potential in Fiora, and Maynith did too. Fiora isn't just a love interest for Shulk, who will follow him wherever he goes. She's someone who has the same desire as Shulk does, to find the answers to why Bionis and Mekonis must keep fighting and to build a bright future that Lady Maynith wanted from the Homs and Machina. Fiora took the time to truly empathize with Maynith and really understand the struggles of the Machina. Maynith needed someone like that, a vessel who felt the same urge to make a change, but who would hold out their hand and lead with an open heart. Fiora is often forgotten as a simple, one-note, one-dimensional basic character, only fulfilling her purpose as Shulk's lover. I've always loved Fiora. 
but after what Takahashi has said about her role in Xenoblade 3 recently in his Ionios Moments art book interview, I appreciate her character so much more. Fiora isn't just a vessel for Maynith or a simple love interest to Shulk, but a fellow Monado wielder who is responsible for carving out a new path and a brighter future ahead. Again, this is Xenoblade at its simplest form in many ways. Fiora and Shulk don't go through the same things that Noah and Mio or Pyra and Rex do, but their relationship is still so genuine. The story of Zanza and Maynith and Shulk and Fiora are also the stories of gods, Homs, and Monados, and the will to shape a strong future ahead. Xenoblade endings are always so memorable and emotional. They hit so hard with the emotions, but also with the themes and overarching messages for each game. I'm not gonna lie, every time I see the ending cutscenes for Xenoblade Chronicles 1, I tear up. Mostly because of how hard the nostalgia hits for me. I remember exactly how I felt when I saw the Klaus experiment for the first time, the decision that Shulk makes, and the final moments you get to see with the cast in Colony 9. But there's so much more to it. I love this ending so much and I want to take some time to talk about it because it stands out so profoundly with the rest of the series in my opinion. First of all, Shulk's decision is one that remains a very, very genuine moment. Of course, we already talked about a world with no gods, but I can't forget what the rest of the characters have to say about all of this too. We've also talked about how Egil lives in the past and Shulk in the future, and with a world with no gods, the people of Bionis and Mechonis can live without any worry of any other force having any control over their lives. They can live one day at a time and cherish every single moment to its fullest, just enjoying the simple moments and things that make them happy, sharing each other's company, a nice meal with each other the special moments and adventures that they might go on, the lessons they learn from each other, and all the other happy moments that they build together with one another. In the end, that's what the party of Xenoblade 1 is fighting for. And I think about that a lot myself. I often find myself worried about the future. Am I doing enough right now to build myself up to be the best person I can? Am I really shaping out a future for myself that will keep me happy and keep me successful in the years to come? And then I think about my past too. My mistakes, regrets, sorrows, and things I might feel ashamed of. Do those still make me who I am today? How much have I grown and how much have I learned from the past to shape my future ahead? And then I remember, the only way I'll become a better person is by living one day at a time, working at my goals one step at a time, and living in the present every moment at a time. That's the most important takeaway from Xenoblade 1 for me. Every day we grow wiser, stronger, and more capable of reaching our goals and seizing our desired future, whatever that may be and however that might look like. But each day, each moment, and each interaction should be cherished in the present and in the moment. The small things and sometimes even the simplest moments can remind you of who you are and how far you've worked to get to where you are today. The final scene of Xenoblade Chronicles is a moment in gaming I'll never forget. Fiora, having regained her Hom's body once again, greets all her friends and comrades she has traveled with. And through her eyes, we see the bright, optimistic, and positive future we've carved for ourselves. Dunban leading the reconstruction of Colony 9 with Vinaya and the other Nopon. The military soldiers being subjected to another round of 100 push-ups and sit-ups, which I honestly feel like they missed after the war against Mekonis. A contemplative and solemn, but happy and content Melia, who thanks Fiora for her friendship and guidance. And of course, Ryan, Sharla, Juju, and Ricky catching fish in the salty ocean outside the colony. When I see Fiora reuniting with Shulk and them gazing at the future that they've forged with the help of Alvis and the Minato, a future where they will walk hand in hand, together, and with even more friends in the future, I can't help but feel emotional. 
I really am a sucker for nice and happy endings in a story, but this one hits very nicely. You worked hard for this, and you feel like it's just as rewarding to you as it is for the rest of the party. Think about a moment in your life full of accomplishment, triumph, and simplicity. Just happiness. A beautiful moment etched in your mind forever. You might know that the future will still have moments of strife and stress, but that didn't matter in that moment in time, did it? This is exactly what I'm sure Shulk and Fuhrer and the rest of the cast felt at this very moment. No matter what the future holds, whether it's Fog Beast, Mobius, or Annihilation events, it doesn't matter right now. This moment will always last forever. This nearly perfect ending would not be as perfect as it is without the beautiful vocals from Sarah Alon from Yasunori Mitsuda's iconic theme, Beyond the Sky. It's still one of my favorite songs in the entire Xenoblade Chronicles series and stands toe to toe with other emotional ending themes like One Last You and Where We Belong. Even now, whenever I hear the song, I think back to this perfect moment in time for Shulk and the party and get emotional remembering how well it was portrayed in this masterpiece of a game. The lyrics mirror the feelings of Shulk and Fiora in this ending perfectly and and coupled in with the dialogue and overall ending, it just comes together in a nice and perfect ending. I know I rambled on about this one particular part of the story for a little too long, but I can't help but feel like this is a landmark moment for this game and a reason why it has a profoundly lasting impact. Every time I complete this game or just sit back and rewatch the cutscenes, I'm always happy to see Shulk and the party bask in the glory of their victory and have their happy ending. No matter how things are in the future, it really doesn't matter in this moment in time. In this moment, all that matters is that they won and they have each other. Alright, thank you guys so much for watching that video. It was a lot longer than I thought it was going to be, but I'm really happy with how it turned out. As you guys know, I love Xenoblade Chronicles a lot. And I haven't really talked about the first game much on my channel. I know that sounds kind of weird. When I first got into the series, I was so obsessed with the first game, and then it took me a while to get really acclimated to the second one, but I feel like on my channel I talk more about Xenoblade 2 and 3, and I know this video topic was also kind of weird because I asked some of my friends about it, I posted on the community, page and some people are like, in defense of Xenoblade Chronicles 1, like, this game doesn't need to be defended. I was really just seeing a lot of criticism and I wouldn't even say negativity, but just takes on this game that I felt like I wouldn't have really seen before even like Xenoblade 3 came out. So I thought, hey, let me just defend this game, say that it is every bit as worthy as it is, and it's just still a masterpiece. I want to now ask you guys this question because I asked a few friends this, asked some fellow Xenoblade Chronicles fans this, I even like made a post on Reddit, I hope you guys don't go looking for it because that's kind of embarrassing, but like, I asked people, what does Xenoblade Chronicles 1 mean to you? What is the central takeaway that you took from this game? what is like the main theme and like lesson that you guys took i know that's a pretty like heavy question to ask but i wanted to know from you guys what was your main takeaway from this game because each of these games have very overlapping like messages and central themes but i feel like they each have their own story to tell and each major takeaway that you can like apply to your life and like remember for the future and so I wanted to ask you guys in the comments let me know in the comments what was your major takeaway from Xenoblade 1 and mostly when it comes to like the central message of the game like the Monado changing the future the will to carve a path forward to a new future ahead living in the present cherishing every, every moment like it may not have to be what I feel or what I've taken away but something that you personally took away from this game if you guys don't mind <laughs> sharing that um it's it's really interesting with games and especially with this series i ask people 
like that very question, what did you take away from this game? And you get a lot of differing answers. And that's something that I do want to chat about with my friend Kevin, the protagonist, in a future Conduit Cast episode. I think we have that in the works, so stay tuned for that. If you haven't subscribed to the Conduit Cast channel, definitely give that a subscribe because that's like 100% Xenoblade stuff. No other <laughs> stuff other than Xenoblade. We're going to be talking about that and, of course, other Xeno stuff. But yeah, that wraps it up for this video. Thank you guys so, so, so much for watching. It means a lot. Like I said earlier, if you like Xenoblade, if you like JRPGs, what are you waiting for? Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And yeah, liking helps a lot. I am very glad to be finally making this video and putting it out to you guys. So yeah, let me know what you guys think. This is Anishwik signing off. Have a great day. Go play some great games today, like the masterpiece. It is Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition. I'll see you guys in the next one. Later. Hey guys, this is Nishquick. Thank you so much for watching that video. And if you enjoyed it, check out these two videos on the left and maybe subscribe if you haven't on your way out. And big shout out to all my channel members whose names you can see on the screen right now. I'll see you guys in the next video. Later.